Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I'm so delighted to have you join us to listen to a wonderful story. And tonight's story is particularly lovely. It's a story from an EMT, someone who works in the emergency services. And she talks about how she had a patient who had a really terrible attack with a wild animal. And she found out that this creature that attacked this girl was in fact a Bigfoot. But she didn't believe the girl. She thought the girl was lying or making it up until she herself saw a Bigfoot when she was on duty in her ambulance. And so the story goes on and I know you're going to love it. So let's get started. And she calls the letter my startling revelation, OMG, Bigfoot is real. So she says here, Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Frances and I'm from Central Oregon. I'm an EMT worker for accident and emergency cases in and around our area. As I want to remain anonymous, I would like to keep all my details as vague as possible, if you do not mind. I wonder how many of your listeners would have believed me if I had told them a year ago about the COVID-19 pandemic. Would your listeners have believed it if I had told them what was going to transpire around the globe? We would experience mask wearing, social distancing and even lockdowns depending of course whereabouts we live in the world. I would never have believed it was possible until I witnessed it with my own eyes. The sad reality of human nature is our continuous scepticism and our inability to believe something until we see it with our own eyes. I think people who have faith or religion are more likely to believe in something like Bigfoot because they believe in something that they cannot see and that belief is called faith. Working as an EMT in the, in, in the pandemic has been very surreal for me. But for those who have not seen what's going on in the front line, I can understand how it's easy to potentially fail to understand how real this crisis has actually become. So let's get on with my story about the elusive hairy man known as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. I just want to say that I rarely regret my cynicism in believing that this creature did not exist. I was one of those faithless people that I'm talking about that had to see it to believe it, or otherwise, as far as I was concerned, it emphatically could not be true. One day on an accident and emergency case, I had to pick up a young woman of about 22 years old who had been attacked by a wild animal. When I got her on the stretcher and put her in the ambulance, I could see how traumatized the girl was, which was understandable. She was shaking violently and her teeth were chattering as if she was cold, but it was a very warm day. I never forget the way her eyes looked. They had this vacant, faraway look in them, as if, she was, as if she was reliving the horror that she had just been through. The girl was in a bad way because her arm was almost torn off her body and both her legs were badly crushed with multiple fractures. I tried to be light-hearted about the matter in order to cheer up the distressed girl must have been a, some attack, I said to her. Was it a mountain lion or a bear, I asked. Who did this to you? The girl paused and looked at me solemnly. You wouldn't believe it if I told you. I did not hesitate to assure her that I was not the disbelieving type, but in hindsight I clearly was, based on my judgments and fixed beliefs. I believe it was a Bigfoot that attacked me, but it's a long story. I know the expression on my face literally read, I do not believe you, Bigfoot doesn't exist. The girl looked at me in frustrated resignation. All right, she said, it was a bear. It was a bear that attacked me. Are you happy now? I never thought much about the incident until five years later. I was driving down a remote country road to pick up an accident and emergency case. A woman had had a heart attack. When lo and behold, I suddenly saw a big black mass standing on the side of the road and it had big brown curious eyes. At first I thought I was seeing a bear, but as I got closer to make a turn to the left in the road, 
I saw the creature extremely clearly, and what I saw was beyond what I imagined even existed here in North America. The creature was definitely a Bigfoot, and I knew that the second I got a closer look. There was no doubt. I would say this thing was seven foot tall and was exceedingly broad, especially in the upper torso area, which includes arms, chest and shoulders. The creature did not have a neck, but a big A-shaped head that was like cone-like in its appearance. His grey facial skin was hairless and he had a fat nose like a pygmy, thin lips and big bright brown eyes. His whole body was covered in dark brown hair with auburn highlights, but it was not as dense as I would have imagined a Bigfoot's hair to be. The creature was huge, which was why I thought he was a large bear in the first place. I imagine many people may have mistaken Bigfoot for a bear because it would be easy to do if you were not looking closely enough. I wonder how many people actually have seen Bigfoot and not realized, uh, well, looked at a bear and, and thought it was a Bigfoot. I was in too much of a rush to get to my patient, but I did get to have eye contact with the creature and it was like he was looking through me, giving me the impression he could mind read, but that was probably fanciful thinking on my part. The encounter was over so swiftly because it was a brief observation of that creature. Suddenly my thoughts went back to the accident and emergency case I had experienced with this young woman five years er earlier who had claimed to have been savaged by a Bigfoot. And when I had disbelieved her, she had backed up on her story and said that it was all a bear attack. Maybe she really had been attacked by a Bigfoot, I thought. Suddenly I remember the doubt and disbelief I had experienced when she told me her story. I now knew that her initial explanation of what had happened to her was probably true, and I knew I needed to make amends when I was off duty. Not only that, but I was also curious to find out what had led to her attack, and I got a feeling she would not be willing to talk. I was right, of course. The girl remembered me clearly as she invited me into her home and was rather offhand at me. It's you, she said. What do you want? I want to apologize for not believing you when you told me that you were attacked by a Bigfoot. The girl seemed surprised by my apology, but she continued to lie. I told you it was a bear attack, she said, and nothing more, it was a bear that attacked me. That's what you said after I did not believe you when you said it was a Bigfoot. I told you it was a bear, she insisted. Please just go. I've not got time to just sit and argue. I made all that Bigfoot stuff up, she said. No, you did not, I said, firmly parking myself on her sofa. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me your story. The girl looked frustrated. Why now, she asked, after all this time? I do not understand. Are you here to make fun of me or tease me about believing in Bigfoot? Not at all, I said, pausing. I have seen one too, you know, and that's why I'm here, because I believe you now. Where, asked the girl, and that was when I told her my story. Suddenly the girl seemed to relax, and then she admitted the truth to me. It was a Bigfoot, she said, but if you tell anyone that that is what I said, I will deny it at all costs, and you will be the one that looks like a prize idiot. Do you understand? I nodded in agreement. Please tell me what happened, I begged. I do believe you. Now I'm going to tell you her story in her words, which she has agreed to share with your audience, providing she remains anonymous. I had been seeing this creature coming into our garden from time to time, she said. It would happen all so very quickly, so much so that I would sometimes wondered if I had imagined it. I had been seeing all these programs about Bigfoot, so I was terribly excited that what I was seeing could be the real deal. One day in our garden, I saw this really huge footprint that was 18 inches and it was of a bare foot with the toe at an angle, which I knew meant that this creature had never worn shoes. Now I was convinced that this shadowy thing that I saw very fast on a regular basis may indeed have been a Bigfoot. At night, I would go into the garden and hear whooping sounds and also tree knocks, so I knew there was something in the forest. On occasion, we would hear dreadful screams, like a woman being assaulted, 
and I also put that screen down to a Bigfoot. One day I decided to do my own squatching. That's what they call it in the Bigfoot community, you know. The national forest opposite our home goes on forever and a day. It's absolutely enormous, so the creature could be anywhere. However, that did not deter me or put me off in any way. I was determined to have my own Bigfoot encounter, or at least find more evidence as to his existence. When I entered the forest, I followed the trail of deer scout, because I believed that a Bigfoot would hang around a food source. I ended up in a clearing where there was a creek and tons of deer scat everywhere, and I was thrilled. I then came across this weird tent-like structure, much like a teepee, made completely out of timber. It looked like it was a man-made structure, but it would have been, would have taken somebody awfully big to stack up all that timber in the shape of a small tent, and for what purpose I wouldn't know. I looked inside the teepee, or whatever it was called, and there was a large nest in there, big enough for a huge animal to sleep on. And the thing that really clinched the deal for me was that it stunk to high heaven of the skunky perspiration kind of smell. I believed at that moment that I, stuck, that, that, that I had struck pay dirt, and this was indeed Bigfoot's sleeping place. I could see no sign of the creature apart from things that made me believe that this was indeed his territory. Some of the timber in the woods was placed in such a way that it looked as if some kind of marking of territory or something. It was sort of like a barricade here and a curled tree trunk there. It had all been purposely done. The next day I got up really early because I wanted to spy on the Bigfoot Tepe. I was also sure he would be there and I felt terribly excited. I did not think for a moment that I would be in danger because Bigfoots have so many human-like characteristics. I did not think such a creature would see me as a threat, but I guess I was wrong. Anyway, as I got into the forest, I did think it was awfully quiet. In truth, that level of stillness was a little disconcerting for me. There were no bird calls, and that was odd, because I always hear the dawn chorus early in the morning, but not on this day. Finally, I reached the clearing and the creek and was surprised to see no deer gathering there for their morning drink. I then did a very silly thing that I regret to this very day. I snuck up to the teepee and was thrilled to hear this loud snoring, and it was noisy but also human-like and very nasal. I peered into the nest cavity of the teepee or whatever you'd like to call it. I could see this large hairy form lying on the ground fast asleep inside this teepee. All I could see was this thing was big and hairy and I wanted to get a look at the face so I peered closer. I was shocked with what the girl was telling me. I would never be so bold as to go out to an apex predator's nest and peer inside. What happened next? I asked. I saw one eye open and then another and it looked as if the creature was shocked and surprised to see me there just staring at him. I think I would be too, I said, if I was a Bigfoot minding my own business and a nosy human comes along and snoops in on me, I think it would bother me a lot, especially if I was the elusive type, and we know that Bigfoot is. What did he do, I asked. He jumped up out of his nest and let out the most terrifying scream, said the girl. It was so earth-shattering that it caused my whole body to vibrate. He then roared at me with a sound far more intimidating than the lions that you see on Animal Planet. I was scared out of my mind. My heart was pounding, but I just could not run. I just stood there like a complete idiot. I think this creature wanted me to just go away. So I must have looked extremely obstinate just standing there. But the truth is I could not move a muscle. I, I felt completely tied to the spot. It really felt as if my whole body weighed an absolute ton and all I could do was just stand there shaking non-stop. It was just like my body refused to listen to my mind which was telling it to run but I just couldn't. I don't know why. What did the creature look like? I asked. Well he was a big fellow, she said. I guess he weighed 600 pounds but I've never been good at that sort of stuff. I would say he could have been seven feet but I'm not certain about that either. All I do know was that he was massive. He was big, he was muscular, and he was very, very strong. I knew the moment I saw him 
that it would take nothing for him to kill me. He could have torn me into two. It would have been easy for him to do that. What about his hair, I asked. What was that like? It was cinnamon brown, but not dense like some people describe. It seemed like he could have alopecia because he had bald areas on his body, which enabled me to see his muscles. He did have the kind of rack that men aspire to, you know. He had muscles absolutely everywhere. I guess you could say he was ripped. What did he do next, I asked. That's the funny thing, he pulled my arm. But it was so hard, the way he pulled it. I don't think he meant it to be that hard, it was like he was pushing me away. But my arm physically tore and the skin ripped too. I then fell over and then he pushed my legs down with his thunder thighs like I was something unwanted on the forest floor. But the weight of his leg was so massive and so heavy, he actually crushed my legs in the process. I did have extensive surgery on them, she said. The doctor could not figure why my bones were crushed like this. What happened next, I asked. After I screamed, the creature looked almost sorry for what he'd done. He seemed to regret what he'd done, and I got the impression that he was upset with himself. Well, he just picked me up and carried me outside the forest on the outside clearing near the main road and just left me there. Wow, I said, in the end, he showed you some compassion, I suppose. Well, I could feel him watching me as I just lay on the ground until a car stopped and then finally called the ambulance. When help arrived, I could hear him going away because he sounded like a rhino bolting off. He really did, it was weird. So that was the story. The creature reacted aggressively, but when it saw he had hurt her, he made sure he got her help by placing her in a strategic position so that someone would call for help. I believe vehemently that this girl's story was true, but stories as dramatic as this rarely get told because of people like me, or rather like I used to be, that are so unbelieving that unless they see it, they just would never take you seriously. This, I believe, is an ideal forum to tell our stories, so we do not face the brutal, unkind, judgmental attitudes of non-believers. I understand where they're coming from because I was one of them too. But is it not sad to have no faith whatsoever? I think it is. Well, I, I do want to say that I do agree with you about not having faith. I think it's very easy for us to doubt something that we haven't seen. And I do love the way you start off your letter and talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, because if you had told me last year that this was going to happen to us and that we were going to experience lockdown and, and masks and the whole palaver, I would never have believed it was possible, but it happened. And I do understand how it's easy to dismiss Bigfoot as a reality unless you've physically seen him. But there are many believers among us who have never ever seen Bigfoot and I'm glad to say and proud to say that I'm one of them because I do think it is liberating to believe in something that you haven't seen and I think the evidence is overwhelming and I'm very very grateful for people who've got the courage to tell us their phenomenal stories and we are indeed getting some phenomenal stories and I'm sure you'll agree with that. But before I end off, I just want to remind people to subscribe to my channel and I want to send my love to all my listeners around the world in America, in Canada, in Kenya and anywhere else where you may be listening. Until next time, goodbye and good night.